Being negligent and failing to follow these five most basic, simple standards could lead to patient death. And hopefully, it's not your relative that just happened to be in surgery when those instruments were used. Hey, sterile processing professionals, Brandon the Sterile Guy here. And in today's video, we're gonna talk about the five critical things you need to know for instrument cleaning. Sorry to interrupt this regularly scheduled content, but I have some exciting news. The Etsy store is eventually gonna go away, but I have a brand new website, thesteroguy.com, where you can buy everything that you could get from the Etsy shop, plus, get better deals. In the Etsy shop, I wasn't able to bundle stuff to give you better discounts, but in my website, you can find bundles for if you wanna go for the triple crown, if you wanna go for the golden crown, maybe you already have the CRCST and you wanna get everything but the CRCST in a bundle and save some money up front, go to thesteroguide.com, check it out. It's a wonderful website. It even links to YouTube if you wanna read about videos, if you wanna purchase bundles, you can still purchase individual packs. And I have also added individual um, tests. So instead of buying a three pack or a six pack, you can buy an individual test if you want, like one, two, three, four, right? So go check it out, thesteroguide.com. Thanks for watching and back to your regularly scheduled content. Yep, today's video is all about decontamination. And not only are these five critical things probably on the CRCST exam, hint, hint, but also they are very important to patient safety and department efficiency, and honestly, just making your frontline work easier. And who doesn't want easier? If you're ready to make your job easier, then hit that subscribe button and I'll get into the five instrument cleaning facts. Number one, point of use cleaning. Believe it or not, of these five critical things, the first one isn't even your job. But as a supervisor or manager, it's your responsibility to make sure this is happening upstairs or wherever the point of use is happening. And if you're a frontline tech, you should be reporting failure to point of use clean to your leadership. And hopefully they're doing something about it. Cleaning absolutely should always be started at point of use. It says this all through Amy. It says this in AORN. It says this on the exam to become a certified surgical technician. I know because I personally had questions for point of use cleaning on my certification exam to become a surgical tech. This is very important and they are taught this in school. So don't let them fool you. We're dealing with blood and fats and these just are horrendous to get off of instruments when they dry. Once they coagulate and the proteins become hard, this can be demoralizing to have to clean these. Why are instruments taking longer to clean and or why are so many instruments making it through your process still with bio burden on them? It could all basically start at your point of use cleaning. Not only should surgical techs be cleaning their instruments in preparation for the cleaning process, you should be cleaning your instruments in preparation to hand it back to your surgeon. As a surgical tech, I always clean my instruments between use because I did not want to hand a completely bloody needle driver back to the surgeon so that their needle driver can't even work correctly or they can't even see where they're grabbing the needle because there's so much gunk on it. Now, all surgical technicians should have sterile water on their back table. And I'm saying sterile water, not saline, because saline actually breaks down instruments and causes damage. You, it has to be sterile water um, if it's on the sterile field. So they can use that sterile water to consist, consistently wipe down those instruments and even place all the dirty instruments in that sterile water cover it with a towel when they're sending it back to sterile processing. Number two, maintaining moisture from point of use to decontam sink. And this can be done with sterile water. This can be done with prep enzymatic. It needs to be something that keeps the instruments moist that isn't damaging like saline. Keeping these instruments moist continues to keep the fats and the blood from coagulating and becoming completely hardened on the instruments. It keeps it moist so it's easier to clean, 
But if you use something like prep enzymatic, it actually starts the breakdown process of those fats and everything that's on there and keeps it moist before you get to the decontam sink. So it essentially makes the cleaning so much faster and easier. Now, the easiest way I've seen to do this is actually have the prep enzymatic in the operating room. So as the technician is breaking down their field and they're putting stuff back in the case cart, they can actually spray their instruments before they even put it on the case cart. And I know there's an argument about aerosols and all this kind of stuff. There is non-aerosol enzymatic that they can put on their instruments in the operating room that does not pose any respiratory risk to the patient or the staff. So that argument is not good. Once we implemented this in one of my hospitals, this became just the standard. Like as surgical technicians were breaking down their field, they actually sprayed their trays on the field before they threw them on the cart and wrapped up their back table cover for the garbage. It was so easy. And SPD managers, supervisors, if you're having trouble getting the OR to comply, go grab your infection prevention and have them fight this battle for you. You don't have to stand alone. You have allies in the field that can help you out. Number three, use of enzymatics in the water with proper dosing and proper temperature. Oh my gosh. This is such a challenge among every SPD I've ever been in. I don't understand how it could be so hard for supervisors or managers or lead techs to set up a process right from the start about dosing so that it never becomes an issue later on. It's too easy. You can either get auto dosers, which are generally free through your enzymatic um, vendor. You can get those installed and they can actually dose your water for you. Or you can have your sinks measured and have your engineers put marks on the sinks for the um, fluid level so that you know when it's full to that level how many gallons that is and then you can do the math the mathematical equation for the enzymatic how many ounces per gallon and then you could even post that right above the sink so anybody can see even if you have a brain fart in the moment oh one ounce per gallon so if I fill up this cup one ounce that's one gallon. If it's six, I'll do six. It's so easy. And then when you have joint commission come into your decontam, if they ask your techs, what's the dosing of your enzymatic and how do you do it? Oh my gosh, it's right here on the wall, one ounce per gallon, and this is how we do it. Or here's our auto doser and it doses this amount, one ounce per gallon or whatever that is, and it makes your surveys so much easier, but it also makes your business so much easier because the cleaning becomes much more effective when the enzyme is properly dosed and when it's in the correct temperature where those enzymes can actually be the most effective. So besides the auto doser, you're gonna need some way to temperature manage. A lot of these auto dosers actually have thermometers that go down the hose and actually sit in the water and keep temperature tabs on that water and will alarm when it goes out of range. Or you could use something like this, which is actually a sticker that can magnetize to your sink, become the sink line, but also have a thermometer to show you what range you're in. Now these are pretty good when you first put them on, but they need to be replaced often. They're extremely hard to get off. And after a while, it's hard to read the temperatures. So I wouldn't necessarily suggest these unless you need to use them as a temporary measure until you can get a more permanent measure. Okay, I'm gonna get off my soapbox of enzymatics. Number four, brushes. And this can be reusable or disposable. I'm gonna talk about both. If your brushes are disposable, they should be disposed of every night at midnight. Like I set it up where my night shift, part of their checklist was to take all the brushes and decontam and dispose of them. They were just gone. And then we started with new brushes every morning. The tech who came in, as the first decon decontam tech of the day, would grab a new brush. And every new tech that came in after that to different sinks would also grab new brushes. We also had plenty of training on when to throw brushes away. And this applies to both reusable and disposable because they can go bad quickly depending on the way that you're brushing. Now, I know this is a really difficult standard for people to understand. And for everyone who has brushed their teeth incorrectly their whole lives, gross. 
But what I wanna tell you is when it comes to brushes and the bristles, it's the tips of the bristles that are the working mechanism. It is not the pressure that you push down on the toothbrush, it is the tips. The tips is what do all the friction and all the work. So if you're pushing the bristles down and they're becoming all twisted and gangly, you're not really effective and it's not working. And usually the reason why your brushes aren't working and you're finding yourself having to push down probably goes back to point of use cleaning and or soaking in moisture. So if you're having to push really hard because stuff is just caked on there, there's a problem before you and your brushes need to be used correctly. If you're currently coming across that where you feel like you have to push harder, you're gonna have to soak your instruments for longer before you actually clean them. Now, when it comes to reusable brushes, you need to make sure you know how long you can use them for. So you're probably gonna wanna date your brushes and you need to inspect them daily that they, the bristles are functioning and straight, nothing's falling out, they're not discolored and gross. Um, most uh, bristle manufacturers require that you disinfect them between days, so you'll need to probably run them through your washer disinfectors. You need education and you need it documented that techs know how to handle and dispose of the brushes and also probably make sure that's happening in real time because when Joint Commission shows up and they find really disgusting brushes and decontam, they're gonna ask you, how are you getting instruments clean with these crappy brushes? So not only will this help you be more efficient in your job, but hopefully you take this personally, you take it home and you brush them nasty teeth. Number five, critical water for rinsing. And this one is becoming huge. This is such a basic requirement that has been in Amy since I can't even remember how long and yet there's still departments that do not have critical water. How does that happen? Most instrument manufacturers call for critical water rinsing before instruments move from the decontam sink to either the washer disinfector or if it's hand wash only prior to going out the window to the prep and pack. And this is also in Amy. It's a requirement in Amy that you critical rinse your instruments. And this critical water, whether it be deionized water, Whatever that critical water is that falls under the requirements for Amy that you choose to follow, it is there to rinse your instruments of remaining debris, detergents, enzymatics, all that stuff that gets left on instruments in between the cleaning process. Yes, you may have got all the bio burden off, but you might have a thick coating of enzymatics. And if that enzymatics gets inside the patient, they may or may not have some reactions that could cause some infections that could cause some really debilitating problems. Enzymes are great for cleaning the instrument. It is not great for wound care. And most of your washer disinfectors have this critical rinse at the end of the cycle, which is usually why you have some kind of deionized or reverse osmosis or whatever water system you have that actually feeds that water to the instrument washers and they critical rinse at the end. That does not replace though at the sink because how often do you clean instruments at the sink and then it sits 30 minutes, hour, two hours before it finally gets into the washer because you're bottlenecking. So all that enzymatic and everything is just drying on there. And what do we know about stuff that dries on instruments? It's harder to get off. So you wanna rinse it while it's still wet so that it's ready for the instrument washer. And yes, in the instrument washer, it will get new detergent, it will get new enzyme, but that'll be introduced in a wet environment. And right at the end, it will critical rinse again. So that's why you need critical rinsing water for your instruments at the point of cleaning. Again, if you've had trouble getting this installed because of leadership and money issues, it's, it doesn't matter if it's a money issue. It is a standard and it has to happen. So you need to get your infection prevention involved and make it happen. It's not a suggestion, it is a requirement. Whew, that was five things that are super integral when it comes to cleaning of instruments. I hope that where you work, you are able to perform these five functions and that your leadership has set up the department where these are well educated and available to you. If not, put your manager to work. And if you're a manager, 
If your staff is putting you to work because you haven't just started on the most basic functions, I think you know how I feel. Any topics or videos you want to see, put them in the comments down below. I love you guys. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank mm -hmm. you.